In Module 2, Elio and John will cover what is known as the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. You'll then hear from Priscilla Mariel Guzman Angelo from Costa Rica IBM Security Operations Center. She'll describe how she uses her skills during a typical day in the life of a security analyst. You'll also learn about the Information Security Forum, a not-for-profit organization that is dedicated to investigating, clarifying, and resolving key issues in information security and risk management. The ISF develops best practice methodologies, processes, and solutions that meet the business needs of its members. Let's get to it. In this video, you will learn to describe the Alice, Bob, and Trudy actors and what each represents. Okay, let's take a look at the uh, playing field so that we can get the lexicon, the terms defined, and the actors. Well, so Alice, Bob, and Trudy, you see this throughout cryptography literature. And so it's A, B, and T are the actors, but back in the 60s, in a few papers, these were given names, Alice, Bob, and Trudy, and they continue today. So uh, Bob and Alice, right, want to communicate securely. It can be for any reason, a personal reason or a business reason. Trudy, who is the interceptor, desires to intercept, delete, admin, um, add messages, change messages, effectively a bad actor. So we take a look at the diagram here on slide seven, and we see Alice on the right-hand side, and Alice has some data. This could be an email, it could be a note, <coughs> could be a web page, a number of elements with that. And she secures this message, moving from clear text to cipher text, transmits it across a channel. Now the channel can be any any form of transmission that we that we can consider. So certainly email, uh, direct transfer, file transfer protocol. It could be a text message these days. Back in the in the Napoleonic period, this would be a letter that a young naval midshipman may carry between Whitehall and other parts of London. So the channel, right, is the transmission mechanism. And within the channel is the data. This is the payload, right? Control messages. Who is it going to? How long is it good for? What's the address of the recipient, Bob, in this case? You know, obviously in the uh, internet world, we look at IP addresses, we look at MAC addresses. In the uh, manual world, we think about the Napoleonic era when British intelligence started its ascendancy. This would be a name and a physical mailing address. So physical mailing addresses are manual interpretations of control messages. So Bob receives the message, decodes it, and has the clear text that Alice had sent to him. Trudy has the ability to intercept these messages on the channel, but because of the secure nature of the encryption, the protection for that, cannot uh, read, or delete, or alter those messages. In this video, you will learn to describe the CIA triad and how confidentiality, integrity, and availability are defined in the context of cybersecurity. Three main components of a security architecture, and that's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. They, they uh, protect data and services within the architecture. What you don't see here also is the authentication side and the access side. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. So let's take a dive a little bit deeper into uh, the definitions for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Is a NIST level definition of confidentiality. So let's take a look at this in some detail. Sorry. So preserving authorized restrictions on information access and disclosure, including means for protecting personal privacy and proprietary information. So let's decompose this first bullet point just a little, little bit. So preserving 
authorized restrictions. Meaning that we've got control protocols that explain not only how, but what, um, what mechanisms are undertaken to have access to the information um, at hand. And the, so there are authorized restrictions, right? This comes from the governance process, which implies that we will protect against unauthorized restrictions. What a great denial of service attack, for example, to simply prevent any access, any access at all by authorized users. So we've got to preserve the uh, governance, the, the protocol for um, access to the information. Obviously, on information access and disclosure, so not only being able to read it, but being able to distribute that are under the purview of access control and maintaining confidentiality. For Bob and Alice, this absolutely makes sense. Right, so, so only Alice and Bob can change how they exchange information and how they protect that. And the per means for protecting personal privacy, right, in the channel before Trudy intercepts, um, and proprietary information. Well, those are two main domains for confidentiality within the enterprise. And we define a failure, a confidentiality loss, as the unauthorized disclosure of information, guarding against improper information modification or destruction. So this is the in-channel distribution that we're protecting information. Now, interestingly enough, there's some U.S. government agencies. They care more about integrity than they do confidentiality. So Alice to Bob, so Trudy can intercept that, but she can't, the government, the, these government agencies have a laser focus that Trudy can't change the message. That's the integrity sort of. That's the guarding against the improper information modification. Right, so a, a terrible, terrible set of circumstances would, to be, would be that Trudy in our earlier diagram could modify a message and neither Alice nor Bob can be aware of that. So the simple let's meet for lunch today can be changed to let's meet for lunch tomorrow. One person shows up, they feel like they're stood up, all sorts of compl um, complications occur there. So one can understand the information, the impact to a mission of a lack of integrity. So. Also within the integrity side of this is the non-repudiation and authentic, authentic, authenticity components to this. Non-repudiation means that neither the sender nor the receiver, Alice nor Bob, can challenge that a transaction occurred. Well, let's define what the transaction could be. In a simple part of it, it could be that the lunch invitation was extended, the message was sent. So Alice can prove that the message was sent and can prove that Bob received the message. So Bob can never say, I didn't get the message, because Alice would have the proof that it was sent and it was delivered. Now that's a simple non-repudiation definition. Let's take a look at a business transaction. In a banking environment, a transfer of $100 from a savings account to a checking account or from Alice's account to Bob's account. Let's take a look at the second. So the non-repudiation is Alice can prove that she moved the $100 from her account to Bob's account and that Bob's aware of that. So Bob could never say, that $100 was never moved because we have message constructs, audit records that proved, in fact, that Alice made the transaction. Alice can prove that those transactions occurred also. So that it occurs from the sender side and the receiver side. That's the non-repudiation parameter that we're discussing in here. The authenticity element it addresses the fact uh, addresses the principle that 
it was a legitimate transaction. So the $100 that moved from Alice's account to Bob's account was conducted by their bank, not some third party, right? So this is that it is an authorized transaction. It occurred within the rules. There's no integrity violations. That's the authenticity side. So the, the definition of an integrity failure or the integrity loss is the unauthorized modification or destruction of information. In the larger context is that if Trudy, the interceptor, destroyed a message and prevented its delivery, that is also an integrity failure. So she not only changed the message, but she destroyed that. So our um, availability definition, this is the last of the three definitions on this, right? Talk about the timely and reliable access to information. Well, this makes sense. Basically, we talk about system reliability. The system will be available 99.99% of the time. That's the type of requirement that we see for system availability. The security engineer, the security professional, will take that availability requirement and be able to decompose that to the deployment architecture so that we can talk about availability for individual components, the sum of which will meet the requirement. So notice there are, are two components to this. So let's just take out the, the second one. We'll talk about the timely access to information. All right, so the ability that a, uh, and this frequently is a system level requirement, that when a transaction request is put onto the channel, that the transaction response occurs within a set length of time, let's say five seconds. Now for air traffic control radar and fire control systems, that timely access is, is measured in microseconds. So once again, frequently part of the system requirements matrix. The reliable access component. This is the actual system availability. So we, we're not talking about how long it takes, but in fact that it does take. And so we frequently talk about percentage of availability time on this. There's a couple of other parameters that can help define reliable access. But once again, the security professional will take a look at these requirements and perform a requirements decomposition and then allocate those requirements to elements within the architecture. So our, our definition of loss availability, right, is the dis disruption of access to an information system. That just makes sense, that it's going to have access responsibly, right, within a certain time limit, and in fact, that the transaction can occur. In this video, you will learn to discuss what is meant by authenticity and accountability in the context of cybersecurity. The last set of definitions that we will work on this module will address authenticity and accountability. Right? Authenticity is the property of being genuine and verifiable. So when Alice sends Bob a message that Bob can, in fact, prove, that the message is, in fact, genuine from Alice and is the correct protocol and is what is expected and can be verified with that. And the accountability side of this is that Bob receiving a message from Alice can prove, in fact, that it did come from Alice. So we think about this in a banking environment and instantly see the application that the um, the banking system, when a um, <clears throat> action is taken upon the account to deposit some money, to transfer some money, absolutely maps that to a known individual. Hi, my name is Priscilla Guzman. I work for IBM Costa Rica in the Department of Cybersecurity. My job position is as MCN admin, and I have to deal constantly with different technical issues that the IBM Curator Security Information and Event Management software could have. Every day there is a new challenge, so there is not a typical day. 
Sometimes we have to use tools such as Xforce Knowledge Center or consider to take some certifications in the area to improve our knowledge. We have to keep learning constantly and I consider this helps me to stay up to date with the new technologies and new emerging cyber attacks and threats. For me, the most rewarding part to work in the cyber security area is to help customers to protect their sensitive data and environment from attacks that we could have day by day. In my particular case, I think this is one of the best technology jobs we have in the present. Thank you. In Module 3, Elio and John continue the cybersecurity discussion around access control and authorization. You'll explore the Open Web Application Security Project, also known as OWASP, whose mission it is to make software security visible. This visibility allows all individuals to see potential threats in their organization. The Access Control Reference Sheet is part of a larger reference sheet series that provides data and concise, actionable guidance on access control and authorization threats. You'll be asked to perform a research exercise using the OWASP Foundation Top 10 Project to hone your cybersecurity research skills. Let's get started. In this video, you will learn to discuss the terms identification and AAA in the context of cybersecurity. You'll also learn how to discuss the three types of authentication and the use of controls. Identification and AAA. Identification. What is identification? It's when we first present ourselves against a resource. This could be by a username and password. This could be by a token. Um, let's use a authenticating against a social network as, as an example. Uh, once we present ourselves with the username and password, the application or the resource is going to authenticate us against its resources. So it's going to make sure that we actually exist under that environment. From there, it's going to authorize us or it's going to give us the proper rights in order to access that information. If we're using the social network example, we should be getting a user type of role associated with us. We shouldn't be able to use any any admin um, type of rights. From there, uh, we're going to be able to have accountability to the things that we do. We spoke about this in an earlier chapter, so we're going to have the accountability of the things that we do with that ID or that authentication, authenticated ID. We're going to explain a little bit better how this works. In order to use a resource, we first need to identify to get the proper rights and the authorization in order to use that resource. When we use that resource, we're going to actually get some accountability of our actions. So everything that we do is going to keep a lot of things. Then um, we're going to talk about authentication methods. There are many methods out there. This can be summarized on three. Um, first thing is something that you know. What is something that I know? Could be a username and a password. Then something that I, that I have. Usually this is being um, broadly used uh, with banking trying to upscale the security. They usually give us a token or a smart card. Then um, that's something that you are. What are we? What can we provide? Um, this usually falls with biometric controls. In this case, we're going to use fingerprints as an example. Something that you have, as you can see, um, this is something that we 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 use on daily lives. Uh, we have a credit card with that chip. The chip is something that we have, and we're actually authenticated with it. Um, in some countries, for example, in the U.S., when you use a credit card, you need to put a PIN. That is something that I know. And then something that I have, I actually confirm that with the the chip that I have. Also, the RCA token, when I authenticate against a banking site, I know that they gave me a username and password. But the RCA token would actually create a random number or token in order to confirm that it's me that I'm logging to that resource. So something that you have is, is going to be something physical. It could be an app on your phone. It could be another piece of hardware. 
but it's something that you're gonna actually have with you. Something that you are. What are we? we what can we provide to the to a server or to an authenticating authenticator method? There are many, many things out there, things all the way from brain waves, frequencies, but the most commonly used are fingerprints. Fingerprints, retina scanners, and biometric signatures, which could fall into anything really. What's the basic flow of this? It's going to start with the biometric capture. Then we're going to translate that image or that sample from the biometric capture into bits and bytes so that the computer can understand and create an algorithm and find that pattern, unique pattern against us. It's going to take that and compare it against the one that it has on its database and it's going to give us a match. Usually there is a range of error. Um, in this case, for the biometric capture for finger fingerprints, we have a 90% chance of actually being accurate for it. There's a 5% error. Controls. Um, we're going to speak regarding controls that we have or that we use on our daily basis. This has been summarized on three um, administrative, technical, and physical. Administrative controls could be any policy or procedure that we have in our enterprise. It could be such a thing as a spam policy. For example, that many enterprises, if you receive a spam email, you must report as spam, that it's something that we can use to prevent that um, malware coming into our system. When administrative um, controls or when the user behavior is in place, we can also add a layer of security with technical controls. We, what could be a technical control? In this case, it could be a firewall. Not only we have our policy control that when a spam email comes into our work email, we need to report it. But in case, in case somebody actually opens that information, we have a firewall. Also, we have our physical controls. Our physical controls could be anything that at this point, it could be a separate room with having different biometric controls in order to get in. It could be a wall, it could be a door, anything that actually physically restrain us from reaching that resource. So control, we spoke regarding the control types that we have, and we're gonna speak a little bit of the subcategories that we also have on those. We have our corrective controls, which actually corrects the problem after discovering it. What can it be a corrective control? It could be a policy, trainings, um, any kind of penalty for breaking those procedures that we have in our enterprise. Preventive are things that actually help us to prevent or to uncover violations of internal controls. What could it be something that is preventive? Internal audits, random internal audits, dissuasive. We are trying to, or with this term, we're trying to dis encourage violators. This could be a camera on a server room um, in order to prevent that type of um, odd behavior around the servers. Maybe a person would stop or would think twice regarding doing something outside the policy or the company's policy because his movements are being recorded. We also have our recovery controls with different things that will actually recover us you know, in case of a disaster. On here, we could mention backups. Then we have our detective controls, which actually help us identify possible violations. On here, we can add our firewalls. Then computing on here, if we were able to identify a gap and then um, it wasn't enough to cover it with a policy, which is an administrative control, we got a compensatory control, which could be a firewall, just in case that somebody actually clicks the spam email in order to prevent that we're from coming into the enterprise, we're gonna have a compensatory control that will actually block any type of malware by um, adding that module into our firewall. On here, I'm gonna share a little bit of a chart which actually goes a little bit more into a little more in depth into the uh, control and type of controls. Also have the type of control, the preventive, the deficit corrective, uh, dissuasive and recovery. In this video, you will learn to discuss the major access control methods, including MAC, DAC, RBAC, and other methods such as centralized and decentralized. You will also learn to discuss access control best practices, such as the least privilege, separation of duties, and rotation of duties. What do we mean by access control? Basically, it's keeping track of who has access to a resource or how we're going to handle this. There are multiple ways on how to do, do access control. Uh, we're going to go through the three main ones, which would be 
max. Mandatory access control, this is usually used in the military when we have our classification of data. On here, a great example that we use is the traffic light protocol. Uh, you can uh, check that out really quick. It's basically you're going to label each one of your documents, name it by T T um, TLP amber green, depending on the um, classification of the data you're actually trying to share. Also, that is widely common, uh, commonly used. It's our top secret, secret and classified. Uh, so max controls usually uh, uses labels to regulate the access, most commonly used in the military. Then we have a discretionary access. Um, each object, file, document, resource uh, has the owner and has the owner to define the rights and privileges. And basically, this is usually used on the small enterprise since it's a little bit hard to keep track of so many objects, files, and folders. The most widely used um, access control methods is our role-based access control. This is associated with the, you have a couple of users, those users actually have a role, which are directly associated with the permissions that they'll get. For example, if you have a cashier doing um, operations, you'll have the role of cashier. Then if you have a manager that shop, you're gonna have the role of manager, which is gonna have a little bit more permissions. This is other, this is works to prevent a little bit of the over giving the privileges or giving the access to resources to the person actually running our operations. What other methods do we have here? We have our single sign-on, which is a centralized type of solution, which provides us that the three A's that we spoke earlier today. Then we have our decentralized solutions, such as the um, independent access controls. They're usually concealed into the local power and normally used by the military forces, such as in the battlefields. On the access controls, there's also a guide of best practices on how to handle your accesses. The three main ones are the least privilege, ensure that your the people or the persons, the resource that actually needs to access that information only has access for the information that it needs to perform that job. Also have the separation of duties. Uh, do not have many resources doing the whole lot of things. Let's say one of those employees or resources actually become disgruntled with the company. What is the damage they could do if they had access to all the resources in there? We could minimize this by having the separation of duties and the least privileges. Also, a good practice that we have is the rotation of duties. Not only will the help the employees to learn what, what the other departments are doing, but it will help us do the tracking and control of their duties. So for best practices, remember at least list privilege, separation of duties, and rotation of duties. In this video, you will learn to discuss various common physical access control methods, discuss various common logical access control methods, and discuss monitoring and access controls processes, such as IDS, IPS, host IDS and IPS, honeypots, and sniffers. We're going to go to access control methods. This time we're going to uh, focus on physicals. Physical access control methods go to perimetral, which could be a fence, to buildings, to work areas, and servers and networks. We usually, on the enterprise type of scenario of, for servers and networks, we have a guest network, we have an enterprise network. For work areas, are the work areas that only authorize personnel can access to it. For buildings, also it's, it's a kind of a physical access control. Um, we should be having the separation of the people who can access that building. And then perimetral things as fences. A great example for this I like to give are the embassies in different countries. They usually keep it really well, or they, they, they actually do this really, really, really well. As per technical control of, 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 or technical uses of the physical controls, what do we use? How do we accomplish it? We can use cameras in order to monitor who is going in and out of a, from an area. We can use traps or man traps. These are the doors that you actually need to pass a batch and it will actually just let one person go through. We can use tokens. We can use lists and locks in order to keep track of who our persons are going in and out of that room specifically. Logic access, logic access control methods. We spoke a little bit of the physical, now let's speak of the logic access controls. On here, it touched a little bit of the topic of ACL or routers. 
we can have a um, rule in order to keep one of each one of our um, resources that we want to use. Um, if we want to limit to the the access on here, we can do it by an ACL rule. We have our GPOs or GOA policies or compliance um, solutions. We can enforce in their password policies, device policies, day and time restrictions. For example, if you, you shouldn't be seeing um, a resource connecting to a VPN network to access our enterprise server at 2 a.m. Um, Eastern time. It's not our usual business. So that is something that we can actually limit. Also something that we can have, have that, that access control, it's for the accounts. We can have a centralized, decentralized, and actually enforce the expiration of those accounts. This all goes or circles back to the best practices that we, we got um, earlier on the curse. So BYOD, BYC, BYU, everything, um, it's a popular concept being thrown out there. In order to enforce it with access control, it takes a lot of effort. We need that strict policy and understanding of the things that we're going to do. We need technical controls for MDM. We need training in order to um, have our resources properly trained to use those. Bring your own device, bring your computer, bring your own cell phone. So this also requires a strong perimeter controls for us. So it takes a lot of effort. Here's a little bit of a chart that was shared with us. We can see that a 40% of our data is associated with YOD. At this point, we are, or the enterprises are pushing a little bit or pushing more into BYD, bring your devices, but they are not doing the same thing with their security policies. So on here, we can see a little bit of the of the charts that are currently shared. So monitoring the access control process. Now that we have reviewed threats and vulnerabilities that can cause damage to the organization, let's talk about the devices and techniques that can secure our host. The first thing that we're gonna mention here is IDS or intrusion detection systems. An IDS is a system that can scan, evaluate, and monitor the computer infrastructure for signs of an attack in progress. It requires hardware sensors and software in order to have the proper deployment on the environment. It's important to keep in mind that each implementation is unique and it depends on the organization's security needs. Also, always remember that an IDS it only notifies you of the attack. Then we have our IPS or intrusion prevention systems. An IPS has that has the monitoring monitoring capabilities of the IDS that we just mentioned, but it can actually block detected threats and still continue to use a passive response for other incidents. And then we have our host IDS and IPS. These are host-based systems that can monitor the host for unexpected behavior or drastic changes on their baseline. For example, it may include file integrity checks or uh, to look for any outbound uh, requests that could be a little bit suspicious. For example, and a, using the trade intelligence IPs, looking for those outbound connections, either on IPS or an IDS. If we wanted to kill that connection, we would use the IPS in that, in that matter. Then we're gonna mention the honeypots. Honeypots, it's a, it's a security tool to lure attackers away from the actual network where they can be monitored safely. While the attacker is on the honeypot, all the traffic and techniques are being locked to be reviewed. Honeypots can be software emulation programs, they can be hardware decoys, or entire dummy networks, which are also known as honey nets. Then lastly, we have our sniffers. The sniffers are also known as packet analyzers. It's a device or program that can monitor the network communications either on the wire or in the wireless network, and they capture that data. Those are commonly used while troubleshooting networks. Something before we uh, finish on this slide that I want to leave really clear, it's the difference between an IPS and IDS. Uh, please keep always keep in mind that an IPS, it's something that we can uh, kill the connection or take action upon. As we can see on the image presented to the right, see item number two, the one below, we see the attacker going, attempting to go to the target, but when the IPS detects that connection, it actually kills that connection instead of in the, on the IDS, we didn't only let you know that the attacker is actually trying to go to that target. So that will be everything for the monitoring access control process. In this video, you will learn to discuss the Open Web Application Security Project 
and find the top 10 web application vulnerabilities for each recent years and how to address each. Another methodology, another best practice that most of the web applications need to follow, here's the OWASP top 10 process. So if you are if you're dealing with a web page, if you're dealing with a web application, if you're dealing with actually not necessarily a web application, but if you're dealing with applications at all, you could use the OWASP top 10 and start performing tests on each of the sections that these organization will have on their on their website. So basically, OWASP, and we will see here uh, a lot of a lot of information on OWASP. If you go to uh, Google and put OWASP on the search bar, you will go to the to the OWASP.org link, and you will get a lot of information regarding these organization that will help you when you are trying to perform a test into your application, into your web application. Actually, there is also a lot of information for mobile applications too. So for example, if you, if you go to, to downloads, you will see a lot of categories here. So for example, let's go to the top 10, uh, top 10 project here, yeah. And you will see that the 10, uh, top 10 for 2017, it's now available. So here you will download the report with all the different uh, information for the top 10 vulnerabilities for uh, the web applications on the last two, three years since two, seven, uh, 2017. So for example, we have as a number one injection. So if we go to page number seven, here's an example of what is, what is injection? What is the process to uh, get information for the system uh, using SQL injection, for example, what are the attack scenarios? What are what are the queries that you need to perform in the system in order to know if your system is prompt or is vulnerable to injection? And you have, for example, here broken authentication, sensitive data exposure. You have a lot of things to test, a lot of th things to prove. And uh, again, if you go to the main website, you will see a lot of downloads. There is something else known as the checklist, it's a document where you will get a lot of documents, a lot of, a lot of controls that you will need to implement, you will need to have on your web applications in order to ensure that your system, your web app is fu uh, fully secure.